Good morning, everybody. Uneducated Economist here. So, you know, in my videos in the past, I have talked a lot about how I am a believer that there's going to be a strong dollar in the future. And that really our major concern that's going on with the economy, at least from the Federal Reserve's view, is not so much the inflation that everybody is anticipating is going to be coming, but how to deal with the fact that we are suffering from a deflationary pressure. And this is very difficult for a lot of people to get their heads around. And, you know, it really was Dr. Lacey Hunt that really kind of opened my eyes to the idea of how deflation can be occurring during a time of mass money printing. But that's what I believe is actually taking place right now or what we would what we would be more concerned about going into the future. Not the inflation, but deflation. And, you know, a lot of people are going to argue with this. And I understand. I, I mean, I totally get it. Because there is insane amount of money printing going on right now. And inflation is described by the amount of, or the expansion of money and credit. And that has been taking place like none other. I mean, overwhelmingly. So, to argue whether or not inflation is here is that's not even an argument. I mean, there is, there, it's like inflation is here. It's definitely here. There is no doubt about it. You cannot argue whether or not we have inflation. What we don't see is price inflation like the Federal Reserve would like to see it. So there is the argument for that. You could go back in time and you could say, hey, look at the way they used to judge inflation. And yet they're comparing it to the way they have inflation set today, which is not even the same metrics anymore. So they're not comparing inflation to the way they used to. They are creating this number for a purpose. It's so that they can keep interest rates in the, in the position that they are because that's what they feel that the economy is needing. It's not to deal with inflation from the way it was set back in the day because those numbers, they, they don't apply like they do today. <clears throat> so I listened to uh, Jerome Powell give his uh, speech in Q&A yesterday. And although I would love to like nitpick every little bit out of it, there was three parts in there that were really pretty close together. It was all within, I think, like maybe a five minute period, maybe not even that, um, maybe even like three minutes. Where he talked about the relationship between interest rates and asset prices. And he was really trying to dismiss that. So at 17 minutes, 17 seconds, and now I'm not exactly positive. I, I'm pretty sure that's what I saw it at, so you might have to take it back to like, you know, 17 minutes and listen into it. But it was somewhere around that 17 minutes, 17 seconds. He's trying to dismiss the connection between interest rates and asset prices. Now, I don't want to get into the macro part of it, but focus in just maybe on just one particular thing to, to raise the argument for this. Okay, because I am in total disagreement with Jerome Powell on that. Total disagreement. I think low interest rates inflate asset prices. And there's no better market to look at than mortgages. The Federal Reserve has been purchasing mortgage-backed securities. That purchasing that they are doing raises, elevates the price of the mortgage-backed security, which drops the yield. Now, the interest rate that you pay on your mortgages comes down. It's the Federal Reserve's asset purchases and that low interest rate that has the home prices elevated on account of everybody being able to now be, a, can afford to make a payment on a much more expensive home. When that happens, the inventory levels start to drop as everybody goes out there to get these homes. Prices go up. It is because of the low interest rates in the mortgage markets that has the home prices as elevated as they are. It is now, we can argue about other aspects of the rest of the economy, but that is a good place to focus. And since that is the major concern of pretty much everybody out there is their home prices or the real estate market, Federal Reserve included, knowing that monetary policy or effective monetary policy requires a functioning mortgage market. So 17 minutes, 17 seconds, I honestly believe that he is either delusional or lying. And anyway, 18 minutes, 30 seconds into it, um, rules, out the, uh, rules out the idea of raising interest rates to deal 
with asset price inflation. Okay, so if you were to raise interest rates right now and everybody out there who's taking out new mortgages starts having, you know, to pay more for their interest, you know, pay more on their mortgages because of the rising interest rates, what do you think is going to happen to the home prices out there? What do you think is going to happen to the inventory levels? They're going to, inventory is going to start to rise as people won't be able to afford the home prices that are out there. The increasing home prices every year of 10% increases or whatever it is, they'll come to an end. They'll have to start dropping down in order to meet the requirements or the capabilities of the buyer out there. So yes, it is definitely inflation or no, I'm sorry, interest rates that are causing asset price inflation. Okay, and yes, raising rates would definitely cause those prices to come down. Just looking at the mortgage market alone. Again, we can argue like other parts of the economy, but since that's the one that functions monetary policy, that's the one I'm going to look at. 20 minutes, 45 seconds into this video, um, you listen to his words. Listen very carefully to what he is saying. Because it is not inflation that he is concerned about. He says we have all the tools in the world to deal with inflation. Or uh, he didn't say that. He says we have the tools to deal with inflation. I'm using, you know, <laughs> anyway, I'm exaggerating that a little bit. He says we have the tools to, uh, to deal with inflation. The bigger concern is the deflation. And you can hear it in his words and in his voice right around that 20 minute, 45 seconds. Back it up to like the 20 minute, 30 seconds and listen into it. It is very, it, you can hear it in his voice. He is very concerned, not so much about inflation, but about deflation. Now, after listening to that, I thought, man, it is deflation that the Fed has always been concerned about. I go and I read their speeches. I listen to their words. It is not inflation, but deflation. They are looking for inflation. They are trying to get it. They are trying to get the money velocity moving. They cannot find it anywhere. And there's no better example of this than over in Japan. Japan has been pumping up their economy with money printing since for decades now. I don't even know how long it's been, but it's been forever. And if you read the articles that I have linked down in the description, you will see that the major concern that is going on right now is not inflation, but deflation. And low interest rate, money printing environment, Japan is suffering from a deflationary scenario. The people there are saving money. They're hoarding cash. Think about that, guys. During a time when the inflation expectation is rising, people are anticipating that inflation is going to come. They're not spending the money, they're hoarding it. It is completely backwards from what I would imagine the central banks would be thinking. You put out that idea that inflation, 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 inflation. Where's the inflation? Why isn't everybody saving their money? Why? Because they're concerned about the future. See, they're concerned about their employment. They know prices are going to rise into the future. And I have a feeling that all this money printing that they've done to stimulate the economy, people are taking the mindset that we have to hold on to this because you're seeing the savings rate rise. A lot of people didn't. They spent the money. They just blew it out there. It's all gone. But the saving rates had jumped in the United States by a lot. And they're jumping in Japan. And they're jumping in these areas because people are getting concerned. They're trying to build up a surplus of savings to deal with the inflation, to supplement their income as it comes. Okay. I know a lot of people probably aren't thinking that's what's happening, but that's what's happening. They're like, man, we can't go out because of all this COVID and lockdowns and everything else. I'm not spending my money on anything. I'm just going to hold on to it. I'm going to hold on to it because if I lose my job, I lose, you know, whatever. Or I need a supplement because of higher prices coming into the future. I need this cash. And people are doing it. During a time when inflation expectations are supposed to be rising, people are hoarding cash completely backwards from what anybody would ever think. And, you know, the major problem with this is, is because it's return on investment from capital. See, when you borrow money and you buy something that is going to make you money, you buy a piece of equipment that you can use to now increase your profits with. And at some point you pay off that piece of machinery. And then every time you work that piece of machinery, it's nothing but profit coming in. That's good debt. Bad debt is when you take that money and you go off and you hang out at the bar and you go out to the movies and you go and take a trip and you buy a new car that you really didn't need. That's bad debt. That does no return. And at some point, 
You have to deal without taking, just working, spending, paying that off, right? Before you can ever take out any debt that'll be profitable. Okay? This is the major problem that the, that the United States is seeking right now. All this debt is going to consumption. If you had debt going to be productive, then it would be okay to do it. But we're taking out ever-increasing amounts of debt to consume. And at some point, we're going to have to stop consuming and start paying on that consumption that we have done. Before we'll ever be able to take out debt for production. Because all the debt that we take out now would have to be going, if, even if it was to go to production, of being like good productive debt. Meaning that it's going to have a return to it. We're going to buy equipment, buy a job, buy whatever it is that's going to you know, produce stuff, serve things start getting a profit from that debt that we have taken out. In order for that to be possible, we have to alleviate all the consumption debt that we have ever done or have so much production that it overwhelms all the consumption debt that we have done. It's just not possible. At some point, we have to take care of all that consuming that we have done. We have to pay off that debt and then we can take out debt that can be productive. All this money down here at this low interest rate world gives no reason for anybody to try and take money and make money with it in a risk-free environment, meaning the U.S. Treasuries. There was a time when you would buy U.S. Treasuries anticipating on holding on to it till maturity. That idea is gone. The only reason why anybody would want to hold on to a U.S. Treasury right now or to buy a U.S. Treasury is because you're anticipating that interest rates are going to drop into the future and you'd be able to sell that bond for profit. The price of the bonds go up when yields drop. So this is going to be the major concern going into the future. We're going to have, I mean, if Japan suffered decades, decades long of massive money printing and almost no growth, I mean, they had growth, they had, you know, they didn't go under by any means, you know, that's not the way, like, you know, to look at it, but look at what's happening right now, go and read those articles, all those decades, it's like all for naught at this point, what are they going to do, you're going to, let's print up some more money, let's buy some more bonds, what's going to end up happening, guys, is that if people start shoving all that money into the banks, the banks are going to start charging them for deposits. And when that happens, you're going to see a hoard of cash. People are going to pull out their cash as fast as possible. And you're going to, and if that happens, you like country after country starts doing this, you're going to see cash hoards really skyrocket. And that's going to be very damaging. <clears throat> it's going to be very damaging to the banking system. As people will have no place to safely secure their money, they're going to pull it out of the banking system. Which is going to seem like everything's cool at first as the dollar starts to rise or the currency starts to rise and become stronger as it's not sitting in the banking system. And the banking system needing that cash starts charging a little bit higher interest rates or providing a little bit higher interest rate so that you start putting it back. See, that's what typically would happen, but that's not going to happen. See, they're going into negative interest rates. And instead of charging a higher interest rate to try and get you to put your cash back in or providing a higher interest rate, they're going to charge you to put your cash back in. Can you imagine that? So now you go to the store and the store wants to make a deposit with the cash that you're about ready to give them. And they don't want your cash because it costs them to deposit it. You see how they can get cash out of the system this way? It will only take a cash hoarding to cause this to happen. You know, I think about that because this is something that the IMF has talked about. How to implement cryptocurrencies into everyday use without causing a cash hoard. 
And the way you're going to do it is you're going to start charging people to deposit or withdraw cash out of the bank. Stores will, uh, stores will be the same. If they take a deposit at the end of the day down to the bank, they're going to be charged to deposit cash. And in turn, if a customer is going to use cash, they're going to get charged a fee. And this is going to discourage people from using cash. Anyhow, um, I could probably go on all day about stuff like that. Probably should. But anyway, I'm just going to leave it at that. Leave, uh, Check out the links down in the description for you guys. Um, again, you know, go back and check out that 17 minutes, 17 seconds, 18 minutes, 30 seconds, and 20 minutes, 45 seconds. Uh, <clears throat> got some letters for you guys. This one was really interesting because this one is from... Uh, Sadie in Pennsylvania and it must have got lost in the mail at some point because this is a date on it from December 23rd of 2020 so it's like over a month ago and it looks like it's a Christmas letter so thank you very much Sadie I really appreciate it let's see what the, what the card has to say Merry Christmas Merry Christmas uneducated economist love Sadie well, thank you very much, Sadie. I really appreciate that. Missed out on the old house. There we go. Missed on uh, hanging that one up with the other Christmas cards I had. But uh, that was kind of weird. You know, I haven't seen a letter ever come in like a month late like that before. So it must have gotten dropped, lost, or stashed somewhere. I don't know. Um, okay, so the next one. This is, uh, I got a couple local ones uh, from, from some guys right here uh, in my state. This one's from... Um, Dale over in uh, Eugene. Well, it says, thank you. Oh, whoa. Really? Right on. Thank you. It says, Dear Uneducated Economist, enclosed is a contribution. What also offer to you, free in addition, can be of even greater help to you. For one thing, I have a business timing for you. I'll re real mail you those monthly notes when I replace my printer cartridges. <laughs> Meanwhile, check your email for the same. Okay. I'm a little confused here. I've been average. I've been advising people this way for 30 years, including a small town banker in Indiana and one in South Carolina. As I offer you free personal and business timing, if you send your birth date, year, birthplace, and timing of birth, my rate for others is 125 per hour. JD Rockefeller, a Great deceitful, a greedy deceitful man. Sorry, said millionaires don't use astrology. Billionaires do. Back when there were few of, back when there were few of them. I don't want to help people like him, but I do enjoy helping good people like you. Good luck. And then he leaves me his email. I am really curious on what. <laughs> What that is all about. But that is, yeah, that's, that's the real deal. Um, all right, man. Well, I got your email. I'm going to, I'll, I'll send you an email. Um, and try to figure out what this is all about. The funky emblem card is made up of just a few of the notes of gratitude for my services that I've received just recently, hundreds more preceded them all by word of mouth. Huh. Okay, well, I'm, I'm really confused. I'll have to go back and read that one over again. Um, 
But yeah, I'm just, oh, I'm sorry guys here, you probably want some of that. People were making fun of the uh, fuzzy dice the other day, but they don't understand. They just don't understand the fuzzy dice, you know? They just don't get it. Okay. Oops, I got glitter all over me now. Guess it was from Sadie's card. Oh, sorry guys, this is from, uh, oh, this is cool. I wanted to see this one. This is from Freedom Stacker. Thank you. Man. I can't wait to... I should have gone for that now. I like it because he, uh, he put the flag, he put the flag upside down. <laughs> yeah, America's in distress. All right, let's see. Oh, right on. Oh, very cool. Freedom Stacker YouTube channel. Love your channel. Keep up the great work, Freedom Stacker. Man, thank you so much. And he sent me this really cool 1964 dime. Thank you so much, man. I love this constitutional silver. Old junk silver stuff. It's awesome. It's not junk because it's made of junk. It's junk because that's just what the name for it is. And I really appreciate it. I have some of these stickers. i got to find something cool to do with these stickers. I don't want to put them on the car here in case I end up getting rid of the car. I want to put them somewhere... And I'll just save them up for when I have something fun to do with them. All right. Thank you very much, Freedom Stacker. That's really cool of you. I really appreciate it. Okay, so this one is from Stewart, Kentucky. Now that is something else. That's like that's a lot bigger than the uh, than the notes I've ever seen, isn't it? I didn't realize that the uh, silver certificates were on such bigger notes. That is very cool. I don't have one like this. Doctor, I hope I hope you don't mind if I read your name here. I guess I'll just call you Dr. Stewart, if that's all right. Um, Dear uneducated economist, thought you would enjoy this. This is a U.S. dollar bill from 97 years ago. It is real, but it's not worth much more than a dollar. It's a 1923 Silver Series certificate. Looks like as the dollar has devalued over the years, so has the physical size. Yeah, I, I, I noticed that too. I, yeah, anyway. Um, I, <laughs> I would have to get a larger wallet to carry many of these around. To give you some perspective, my grandmother used to tell me that they were that they were well off during the Depression. She worked at a large department store in Philadelphia making $15 per week. My grandfather made $5 per week as a carpenter. Wow, so that was pretty interesting. She made five times more um, when he could find work. Okay, yeah, correct, because it was the Great Depression, sure. Uh, so one dollar was worth a whole lot more back then. Keep up the great work with your videos. I love watching them. Respectfully, your Stuart. Thank you so much, Stuart. Man, that is a awesome, badass note to have for the collection. I really appreciate it. Very cool. Very, very cool. Thank you. Oops. And we got one more here. Now this one is from Portland, Oregon, which I really appreciate. Like somebody local here, you know, always. First five dollar bill from nineteen eighty five. 
Well, thank you. There's no letter or anything with it. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, I'll just use you. I think it's just your last name, Owen, um, from Portland. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Um, that's actually a, a really nice, you know, a really nice condition from, you know, considering it's from 1985. That's pretty cool. So, yeah, that's definitely going in the collection. So... Well, that was all of them. So anyway, let me guys, let <laughs> you guys let me know about the um, about what's going on over there in Japan about the Federal Reserve and their uh, deflationary concerns more than inflationary concerns. And uh, yeah, we'll have a great conversation over that. All right, uneducated economist, you guys let me know. Good morning, everybody. Uneducated economist here. So. I wasn't going to talk about GameStop just because there's so much news going out there. I didn't want to bring any more attention to it, but I've had a few people email me asking me to talk about GameStop. Um, you know, my buddy messaged me this morning, you know, talking about GameStop. So I know what's on everybody's mind, what's going on with GameStop. And, you know, really what this comes down to is the Reddit community and the power of the Reddit community because these guys have a platform and a willingness and ambition to do just about anything out there. I mean, it never ceases to amaze me what the Reddit community can do. And when they caught wind of GameStop being shorted by a hedge fund, they got together and really started pumping money into GameStop stock. And that pumping of GameStop, Game, GameStop stock has sent it to like ungodly high numbers. Um, before I started this video, it was trading over 300 um, in the early morning trade. I think it actually dropped down below 300 um, as of like actual recording of this video, but it was, it was at 300 at one point. $300 per share. That's up from like six bucks just a few months ago. I mean, I don't even know how much money must have gone into it to to bring the price up to this sort of level. Now, what the Reddit community was doing was they were trying to damage that hedge fund for shorting, taking on a short position on GameStop. And it's kind of complicated to understand what was happening there and how they were able to do this and damage that hedge fund as bad as they have. Because if you're not quite understanding of how a short position works, the easiest way to un to understand it is like, if you can imagine like you see a stock that you think is going to go down, you think the, you think the price is going to go from $10 to $5. Okay. What you do is a shorting position is, is you basically pay a fee to borrow the stock from somebody and you sell it on the market. When the price drops, you buy it back and give it back. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? So you've borrowed stock, sold it, intending to buy it back at a cheaper price and you're going to keep the difference in between. That's the short sale. That's how you make money on the market going down. And it's a very common trade. People use it all the time. And hedge funds are no different. And they borrow money and leverage it up so that the amount of money coming out of their pocket is very small and the amount of profit that they get is very large. The only problem is, is that if that short position works the other way, the amount of money that they can take as a loss can be immense, especially if it's leveraged up as much as the hedge funds like to do it on a drop like that. When it goes into the to the realms of what has happened with GameStop, where you go from just a handful of dollars up to hundreds of dollars, the losses are immense for a hedge fund. And from what I understand, it was into the tunes of like billions of dollars that this happened. The Reddit community was responsible for this. I mean, they want, you know, these younger people use the platforms like, I would assume like Cash App or M1 or something like that, Robinhood, and went out there and bought GameStop at any price just to throw money at it to cause the prices to rise to damage this hedge fund. And it worked. Now, I think about that and how effective the Reddit community is because that was... That was an amazing event. And to think that they're moving on to AMC or BlackBerry right now, it's like 
a new kind of movement that's almost taken place where, you know, the Reddit community as a whole can take on these big Wall Street firms, you know, any like the power of people, like even if you just have a handful of dollars, but if you have millions of people throwing that money at, in a particular direction, you can make things happen. And that's what's going on with the Reddit community right now. And I remember like years ago, they did it with Dogecoin. Like they took that cryptocurrency, what was meant to be a joke and pretty much made it legitimate when they had sponsored a NASCAR, check it out, put in Dogecoin NASCAR. And you would see about, oh gosh, I would say is five, six, maybe seven years ago that took place. But it was really crazy because all of a sudden here you see Dogecoin ripping around NASCAR track. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to bring so much attention to Dogecoin to do that. They also voted that particular driver the number one NASCAR driver nobody had ever heard of him. You know, so that's the power of the Reddit community. They overwhelmingly took over the, basically, overwhelmingly took over that voting for the number one NASCAR driver and being able to sponsor a NASCAR, they could probably do that forever if they were that motivated, you know, and eventually it passed because the motivation eventually ends and people get tired of throwing $20 at something. And that's what's going to happen with GameStop. On the flip side of this is that the people who have stock in GameStop just scored hugely. So this little Reddit movement to try and take on this hedge fund just made a handful of people incredibly rich. If they weren't already rich enough, now they're really rich. So good job, Reddit community. Great job. But that's what happened. And when you're moving on to AMC, same thing's going to happen. Somebody there is going to get really rich on your $20 that you're throwing out there with all the millions of people doing it. See where I'm getting at here, guys? See, this is one of the reasons why I didn't want to bring a whole lot of attention to this thing. But if I let you know this is what's happening on the backside, it's not all taking on this hedge fund. It's not all about like, you know, taking on Wall Street and sticking it to them because there's a handful of people out there who are going to make a lot of money off of you. It's a pump and dump. Okay. And I would be very leery about joining in on those things. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not telling you guys what to do with your money or if you feel that this is a... a a movement that you need to be part of, that's your game. But I see a handful of people out there who are making a lot of money off of this right now and only one hedge fund being damaged. So anyway, I got to go into work, uneducated economist. You guys let me know.